for those of you who need that warning. All right. So part two, we are going to be diving back into this concept of emotional resilience today. And just briefly, for those of you, most of you, I think, uh, already know me well. Um, some of you maybe know me from just last month, but just as a brief reminder, um, I'm a life coach. I got my certification from UC Davis six years ago. I am overjoyed today to have uh, two, at least two, I think just two, but two of my uh, colleagues from that uh, cohort at UC Davis are on today. I'm so excited about that. Um, after I graduated, I started my own practice, Ever Present Life, and I was doing one-on-one um, -on -one coaching and group coaching and small group teaching for about five years and then about a year and a half ago now I started working as a consultant with St. Mary's College where I am helping their students learn how to cultivate emotional resilience through peer mentoring and peer coaching. And so uh, part of what really qualifies me most to be doing this in addition to the certification and all of that is the fact that I have anxiety and I've lived with it now for over 10 years and Oh boy, this year has uh, been an adventure when it comes to that because I thought I had it really well under control. Uh, I did not have a global pandemic on my 2020 bingo card. And so um, I have been learning all kinds of new things about my anxiety. So um, yeah, it's uh, it continues to keep me, I feel like it's continually helping me to be able to say that, yes, this qualifies me because I'm managing the heck out of it. And uh, for any questions, if you may have them, you can always visit my website or if you're on Instagram, you can follow me there. And I always love to follow people who uh, follow me back so I can see the world through your eyes. And um, so in my work at St. Mary's, uh, I created the wholeness framework, which this is more of the... Um, slightly modified version to work for, for my personal coaching practice as opposed to the uh, language that the campus uses with their students. So it's just a little more tailored to uh, my needs, but it is all, all the domains that you see here are essentially the same. And uh, so the emotional or the cultivating emotional resilience in the yellow there, that is the area that we are most going to be focusing on for these workshops um, last month and this month. Next month, we're going to start to go into some of the other areas, connecting with the world, caring for your whole self. But you'll remember last month, we really focused on internal self-worth. And that looking in the mirror exercise was um, the best way that I have found to be able to help people learn how to see themselves more clearly and reconnect with their internal sense of self-worth and really own these things about themselves that are so wonderful. And so um, this month, we are going to be focusing more on the third domain in cultivating emotional resilience, which is finding fulfillment, and especially finding fulfillment during, uh, in the midst of adversity, because that is absolutely possible. And especially when happiness is in very short supply, you can still find fulfillment. And so I want to um, share a practice with you, kind of like what we did last month, where we're gonna be uh, learning a new practice that you can use to help you find fulfillment through identifying your core values. And so just to recap briefly what we talked about last month, and that way we can kind of flow right into that fulfillment domain. The wisdom of internal self-worth is really this, is that rather than defining your worth by the external world, which is your accomplishments, your academics, your um, appearance, or maybe the approval of other people, finding your internal self-worth is really about a sense of self-worth that is not defined by the assumptions, judgments, or expectations of the external world. It is really all about you, who you are inside, what you value. And so, um, a lot of times when we talk about self-worth, uh, we talk more in terms of what we deserve. We feel we deserve to have a, a better paying job or we deserve to have uh, someone in our life that we can be in a relationship with who respects us and appreciates us. We feel we deserve these things. And the thing about internal self-worth is the idea that you don't have to receive that in order to know that you are worthy of it. Like the deserving it and the getting it is not what validates your worth. What validates your worth is the knowledge that regardless of whether you actually have those things, you are still worthy of them. And so when you derive your worth from the external world, 
the primary thing that tends to motivate us in that case is fear. So fear of failure, fear of disappointment, uh, fear of loss. These are all things that happen when we derive our worth from what other people think about us and from what our successes are versus our failures. And so this idea of shifting to internal self-worth, when that is the place that you are coming from, that means that your main motivation is one thing, really, and one thing alone, and that is to express your core values, which is the thing that we are going to be focusing on the most today. And so when I say core values, I just want to be clear. I mean that these are the things that are the catalyst for every single belief, motivation, intention, thought, feeling, and action in your daily life are literally uh, expressions of your core values. The reason I am wearing polka dotted socks today is an expression of my core values. I cannot tell you essentially which one off the top of my head, but it's like that minute of a detail is, is really influenced by our core values. And so the benefits of having core values awareness, and you will understand why this is such an important piece of fulfillment, is that when you have core values awareness, this can help you make hard decisions with a greater sense of trust in yourself because you know what you value and you know what aligns with your values and you know what doesn't. And when I say it makes hard decisions something you can do with greater trust in yourself, that doesn't mean it's going to be easier to make those hard decisions. Um, unfortunately, like knowing your core values doesn't make anything easier. <laughs> um, it just makes it more possible. It makes you it helps you to find the courage to do those hard things. And when you know what your core values are, it can also really help you advocate for what's important to you. And um, brief side note, I forgot to mention this, I will be sending a PDF of all of these slides. So if you are frantically trying to write this all down or you're taking screenshots of every slide, just know that I'll be sending these to you uh, when we're all done tonight. So uh, the third thing that's really important about the benefit of core values awareness is that it can help you build healthier relationships with people. Because when you know what you value, and especially today when you start to understand this process of how to identify what you value, you will be able to both infer what other people might value and also help them be able to identify what they value if you have children or a partner or a friend or someone in your life that you want to be able to teach this to you will be able to it's a very simple process and then the last thing that is uh, again really tied to this domain of fulfillment and emotional resilience is that when you know what your core values are expressing those in your daily life is what helps you find fulfillment even in the midst of adversity. And so I wanna go out on a limb and state something that um, I feel more and more confident stating these past, you know, this past year and a half, I would say, is that, you know, there's this idea of fulfillment is really tied to meaning and purpose. And this idea of finding our purpose can be really stressful because a lot of times people feel like, oh, I need to find my purpose in order to find fulfillment. I don't know what my purpose is though. And so we run around trying to find the career or the relationship or the life circumstances that are gonna produce that sense of purpose and that sense of fulfillment. But here is what I have found over the years with this core values awareness process is that we all have the same purpose in life. And it's very, it's just that simple. It's only that that same purpose looks different for every single individual, but the purpose is actually the same. And that purpose is to express our deepest, most consistent core values in our daily life. And so the reason that looks unique is because every individual has their own unique set of core values and the way they express them can look very different. You know, even if two people had the exact same set of core values, which I have never had happen, uh, they would express them differently because they have different life experiences and different, you know, traits and tendencies. And so this idea that, you know, we all have the same purpose, but it just looks very different. It means that you can find that sense of purpose and meaning in any situation, as long as you know what your core values are and you are able to express them. And you can express a core value in dozens of different ways, that there isn't just one single way that works. 
And so when I say core values, again, I just want to make sure we're very clear today because you are going to be identifying your own. And, um, and so these are five examples right here of core values. So empowerment, clarity, respect, authenticity, consistency. Um, there are so many others. I mean, I could give you a sample list of hundreds of words and that would still not be enough because I provide that sample list when I do these workshops a lot of the time and people use it for about the first five minutes. And once they get the hang of the identifying their core values, they just start, I had a few people would raise their hand and say, my value isn't on here. I'm like, I know, <laughs> like you could toss the list. Like once you know how to find your values, you will know what words feel right for you and sound right for you. But just so you know, and I'm sure you all did, like apple is not a core value, <laughs> okay, right? These are very specific words that have, you know, honesty is a, is a big one. Another one that comes up, trust, um, fairness. These are the types of words that we are talking about. And when I have people identify their core values, I don't want you to necessarily stop at just one word. Sometimes it is just one word, and it's probably a really big word. You know, it's just, you'll know if there's only one. But the majority of the time, I really encourage people to identify what else do you, what other words, or one or two or even three words, do you associate with that first word that comes into your mind when you identify a core value. So for me, empowerment is very much tied to worth and dignity. And that may not be the case for you. You may find that, you know, respect is also a core value of yours, but you would have different words besides appreciation and unconditional gratitude. And this is what I mean by our core values are very unique to us. And so it's not important that I know what you mean by these words. It's important that you know what you mean. And so asking for an additional word or two to add on to that initial core value word that you find is going to help you be able to really um, tailor this list of your core values to you. And so briefly, I'm, um, you know, I really want to try and give you all a chance to understand this core values process through the experience of it rather than me telling you about it. But there are some interesting and I think really important key things that people need to understand. So I've done this process now with individuals on a one-on-one -on -one basis dozens of times. And if you count the number of classes I've taught and now my work at St. Mary's where I uh, facilitate this process for sometimes upwards of 80 students at a time, um, I've done this hundreds of times. And that has been enough for me to start to see some patterns that have emerged in this process. And in general, we each have about 10 to 15 core values. So I have had a handful of people in my career that have had over 15, closer to like 18, maybe even 20. And they are, um, probably maybe not surprising, very complex people. <laughs> they have a very complex inner world. Um, a lot of times they tend to be artistic um, or just doing something in the creative field. Um, and then there are also people who are on the opposite side where they tend to have a very small number of core values, like seven or eight. Um, again, does not happen very often. Those people tend to come into my sessions already knowing what they value and they just didn't really realize it but it's very easy for them to find their core values. And so, um, yeah, they, and that's not to say that they are necessarily simple people. They are just very cut and dried. Like they know they have their ducks in a row and they know what is important to them. So the vast majority of us though, fall into about 10 to 15. And most of us don't know more than half of those values. We really just couldn't put words to them if we had to. Um, and so our values appear at a very early age. Um, the science behind this is kind of, uh, I think, lagging, but really at this point now they've identified that even as young as eight years old and even six years old, uh, children start to express core values in their life. And so what I have found is that those core values from your very young years of your life remain actually very consistent over time. And again, the research is kind of inconclusive about this, whether they are genetic or whether they are acquired through our environment. But the one thing is, you know, it looks like it's something along the lines of personality traits, which seems to be about a 50-50 split, which means that for any 
particular core value, there's a 50-50 chance it's genet it came to you genetically, like through one of your parents or it came to you environmentally and there's really no way to know and even those environmentally acquired values just like environmentally acquired personality traits they aren't necessarily things that you choose it's not like you choose to be introverted or extroverted it kind of chooses you for reasons that you know science still doesn't fully understand and so it's not necessarily important to identify where the value came from i have had people sometimes who get kind of caught up in that especially when they identify a core value that they quite honestly would rather not have and um, there are a few examples of that i can provide later on if anybody's curious but when they find a value that they maybe like or don't like um, they, they tend to want to try and figure out where it came from it's going to be hard to know. Again, it's about a 50-50 chance. So rather than focusing on where it came from, I always find it's more productive to focus on how you are expressing it, just like all your other values. How are you expressing that core value? There are three things about our values that do change, um, in my experience, when working with clients. The first thing is how we express them. So how you expressed a core value at the age of 10 is probably not going to be the same as how you expressed it at the age of 50 or 60. Although maybe sometimes it's surprisingly similar. I don't know. Um, you can also change how satisfied you are with your ability to express that core value. And so this can especially change when you go through major life transitions, like if you have a, a baby or maybe you have kids that are growing up and they go off to college and then you have an empty nest. These are transition periods where how you were expressing your core values before that transition might be very different than how you would express them after that transition. And um, I would say that part of the reason why this past year has been so challenging for so many people is that it has been full of nonstop transition. There's just been people who are, you know, going back to working from home and then they're back to work at their workplace and now they're being sent back home again their kids were in school and then they were back home in school you know doing home school and now they're back in school and then the teacher tests positive for coronavirus and now they're all sent home for two weeks you know it's just this constant shifting back and forth of all these transitions and so how we express our core values in that type of environment is can be very challenging especially if you don't know what they are and so one of the last things that does change as well is, again, the priority that we place on those values. Certain ones are going to be more important to us in certain situations. And then when that transition happens, that prioritization might shift. And so these are all things that once you know what your values are, you can work with this. You can figure out how to change the way you express a value. You can figure out how to, you know, if you're not satisfied with how you're expressing it, you can find ways to be more satisfied by that. You can um, better understand what your priorities are. But this all involves once you know what your values are. So if you don't know, this is all a shot in the dark a lot of the time. And that is, I think, part of, again, why this year has been such a big challenge. So when we don't know what we value, which is, again, the, the, the case for a whole lot of people and for a whole lot of their values, 50, 75% of them, um, we tend not to really be able to identify. Um, when we don't know what we value, that means that basically we're still expressing those values that's the thing even though you don't know what your core values are you are still expressing them and so when you're unconsciously expressing these unidentified values that can sometimes end up meaning that you're going to express them in ways that are not necessarily healthy and you know it's even possible that you could express them in ways that are illegal to be perfectly honest because you know everything we do is motivated including you know people who commit crimes it's not like they were motivated by a value of being evil you know that is not evil evilness is not a core value right they are motivated by something and that something is neutral but the way that they are expressing that value could be very unhealthy or illegal and, and hurtful towards other people even. And so when we don't know what we value again we can express things in unhealthy ways we might accidentally adopt other people's core values, especially like our parents or the society that we've grown up in, we may 
try to ignore our own core values, unconsciously ignore them, you know, kind of shove them in a box and put them away in order to try to adopt the ones that we think we should have. And we end up living this life that doesn't feel authentic to us. We think that it will be fine as long as we just, you know, keep trying and keep working at it. And once we get down the road and we succeed at whatever we're trying to do, then we'll feel better. But how many of us have actually gone down that road and tried to achieve those goals and, and achieved them and waited for the feeling better part and it never comes? So at that point, we are forced to reconcile with the fact that we may actually be living somebody else's version of our life. And so this process is very helpful for being able to, um, if you have gone down that road, which I certainly have many times in my life, uh, uh, part of why I think uh, it all kind of, you know, hit the fan for me about 11 years ago when I started having panic attacks was I had gone so far down <laughs> the road of somebody else's life <laughs> thinking that it was my own. So when we are unconscious of what we value and we are not necessarily living in alignment with those values or we are expressing them in ways that aren't healthy, um, it's very hard to navigate change and adversity. And that's really, I think, the big take home that I've been um, already mentioning about this living through the time period that we are living in is that this is a challenge. And knowing your core values, again, isn't going to make anything easier but it is going to make it more possible. So, you know, it's really under, it's just really, I cannot emphasize how important it is to know that, you know, your values are your own. They are unique and they've always been there. So being able to identify them is going to really help you be able to hone in on what, what is your path and how do you walk it? Whether the times are good or the times are challenging, the path remains the same. And the way that you walk it is to be able to express, identify those values and express them in your daily life in whatever ways you are able to, depending on your circumstances. So the reason I think this is going to be the most helpful today, this is kind of, we're almost here to the end of my little lecture piece. Um, I, I think part of... There is this challenge of just basically dealing with nonstop transition. That certainly is a challenge. But there has also been a lot of conflict. Um, and these conflicts arise from um, the world not aligning with our own expectations of it. These conflicts arise between individuals. You know, how many of us have gotten into a heated political conversation, either with friends or family or online with a total stranger, <laughs> you know, to the point where your blood pressure goes up and you don't know why you're having an argument with a total stranger that's, you know, making you feel so stressed. But, like, conflict has just been everywhere this year. And so we need to talk about this idea of where that conflict is coming from. And I think there are some things that I hope this will clear up for people today because before I understood core values, I thought conflict was, I, I didn't, I assumed things about where it was coming from that ended up not being true. So anything that frustrates us, upsets us, or makes us angry is something that is what I consider to be a conflict. And that conflict comes because of it's directly conflicting with our core values. Okay, this is really the biggest thing. I used to think there was this thing called personality conflict, right? Somebody else, I didn't like them. Couldn't tell you why I didn't like them. I just didn't like them. And I wrote it off to their personality, the way they acted. But once I understood what my core values were, I realized, oh, this had nothing to do with them or their personality. It had everything to do with the fact that whatever their personality traits and however they were acting, they were doing things that were conflicting with my core values. So it's not a personality conflict. It's a core values conflict. And so it's a lot more productive when you have an argument with somebody and you don't like them or you're frustrated by whatever they're doing, rather than personalizing it and blaming it on them and calling them a terrible, awful person, you can start to articulate, you are stepping all over this core value of mine right now. Maybe you don't realize that. <laughs> you can actually start to advocate for what you value and have conversations that are different and more productive. 
And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to lead to um, compromise or understanding. Well, they will lead to greater understanding, but you still may never want to talk to the person again. But at least you will understand that it's because of that core values conflict and not because of them as a human being. And so, um, you know, this is a really important thing, again, to that idea of having healthier relationships through core values. Just because the relationship is healthy doesn't mean that it is two people who are getting along all the time. I have very healthy relationships with people that I don't speak to anymore <laughs> because I put healthy boundaries in place as a result of realizing where my core, what was, you know, the core values conflicts that kept happening. Like, you know, it just, it, that, that can be a healthy relationship too. Walking away from a relationship that you know is not in alignment with your core values and somebody who isn't, um, you know, you may not be in alignment with their core values either. And that's okay. Again, it's not personal. So the reason that being able to understand this core values conflict when it comes to two different people is important is because it is not uncommon for a person to have two different core values that they hold that conflict with each other. <laughs> so where you may be having core values conflicts with people around you, you may actually be having internal core values conflicts with yourself. And although it doesn't happen all the time, it's definitely not uncommon. And there can be times where a person will value such totally opposite things as both certainty and uncertainty. I have had that. It's not, that is not an uncommon combination to value both of those things. So when you don't know that that's the case, you just are constantly living with this sense of internal conflict. But once you know that you value both and that it's not necessarily going to be fun, but there are ways to be able to honor both of those values simultaneously, you have to get creative. But this idea of having core values conflicts internally with yourself is something that helps you be able to better understand yourself and better understand your life. <laughs> and um, it's not uncommon when people realize that they hold a core values conflict inside themselves. This is to be able to like make better sense of like the entire previous, you know, entire extent of their life. <laughs> because all of a sudden it makes sense why they felt so frustrated for so long about certain things. And so the last um, thing about core values conflicts that I just want to make sure that we understand is that Again, the idea of resolving core values conflicts, whether it is with another human being or whether it is inside of yourself, takes awareness, it takes flexibility and creativity and courage to be able to um, adjust those. So the skills we're going to be learning today and the things we're going to be learning today, um, I'll, say it, I'll say it again and again because your inner critic is going to want this to be easier. It's going to want something that's going to make life easier. And I, I cannot offer you that. But what I can say is that understanding all of these things, it will give you that courage that you need in order to be able to do those hard things. And so this is the process, okay? And I am going to be um, copying and pasting these questions into the chat box when you get paired up with somebody to go through these questions together. So I don't want you, again, to, to worry that you have to handwrite all this out or, you know, screenshot it. I will copy and paste these questions so you don't have to do that. But for now, I just want to show them to you here. And after we're done, um, after I'm done talking, we're going to go back into the main session and I am going to do a demo of this process with everybody, uh, with one person, so that everybody gets a chance to see what that looks like. And I may even do it twice. And then once you all have a feel for it, I am going to have you break out into pairs and go into breakout rooms and have this conversation together with each other. So that's just a heads up of what we are about to go do. But before we do that, I want to um, really quick go give you an overview of these questions. So in order to identify a core value through conflict, the first thing you need to do is isolate a thing that has frustrated you, upset you, or made you angry. And there is no time frame on this. You can take this as something that is an ongoing thing that has always frustrated you, upset you, or made you angry. You can isolate this to just within the past week. 
Um, if you would like, you can look at this more as more of the 2020, like what is something that has happened in 2020 that has, you know, frustrated you, upset you, or made you angry? I'm sure that list is not necessarily short, um, but just pick one thing. We only need one thing to deal with at a time. You can do this for everything on your list, but we're just going to stick with one thing. And then in that situation, so um, I'm going to ask you to just share a little bit about it. You don't need to go into great detail. But you need to go into enough detail that you have an understanding of sort of all of the different uh, aspects of it because the next step is I am going to give you, um, or whoever is facilitating this for you, is going to give you total control of everything in that situation. So if this is involving you and another person and some circumstances, you get control of all of it. <laughs> you get control of your own mind, the other person's mind, the things they do, the things you did, the circumstances that you find yourself in. You're going to get total control here, all right? And so the question is, whatever that thing that's upsetting you, if you had total control, how would you change it? And so, you know, there's going to be plenty of changes you may want to make, but we're really looking for kind of what is the biggest change, like the main change that you would make of that situation if you could. And so once you know what that change is that you would like to make, that's when we're going to start to understand better what is it about this change that you value most of all, because that is what's going to lead you to that core value, okay? So as you complete these three questions here, that's the thing that by question three, you're going to really hit on a word or a phrase, something that's going to jump out at you about what it is that you value most about that change you would like to make. And that question four is going to be more about building out the value, the core value bundle. So you don't just have one word or phrase. You're going to ideally have another word or two or three that you would add on to that so that you can create your own little core value bundle. And that will be one of your core values. So that is the basic process. And um, I realize easier said than done if you've never seen this done. If you've seen me demonstrate this before, or maybe you've even gone through this before, and I know there are a couple of you who are on here who have. So I'm really happy about that because that means if you get paired up with somebody who's never heard anything about this, that's, um, you know, that'll be a big asset. So please know that I very much appreciate those of you who are coming back for this uh, uh, this subject again and again because you're going to be a big help to me as we're doing this in pairs when we break out. But um, before we get to that, again, I just want to do a demonstration. So if anybody has any questions, I'm going to scroll through really quick and I'll see if I can see anybody waving or giving me an indication or you can maybe drop it in the chat. But honestly, I'm not smart enough yet to know how to find the chat box once I get into the shared screen. So I don't see anybody desperately waving hands, so I'm going to assume that uh, we are good. I'll stop the share, and I'm happy, of course, to answer questions once we're out of the shared screen, too. So, all right. Now that we've got everybody back. So for this demo, I, um, I didn't think to give anybody a heads up ahead of time. Sometimes I like to do that so that people at least can consider it. Um, especially if you might be a little more on the introverted side and you would like to volunteer, but you don't necessarily like for things to be like, you know, out of the blue. Is anybody willing to uh, volunteer to have a little conversation with me right now about um, identifying one of your core values? Anybody be interested? And I'm gonna, and you can give me a little wave or you can just unmute yourself. And I'm patient, so I can wait. I'm willing if no one else is, Becky. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. You know, I knew. I was like, you, because I've had you in my workshops before. You, you, you have that. <laughs> well, and I've done this whole thing with you, but I have a couple of things now that I am working and my life has changed a lot that I am trying to figure out how they slide into my values. So, okay. Good. This will be interesting. Yes, that's true. You have, boy, talk about transitions. <laughs> One, word, but, one word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Um, so we're just going to stick with the process, right? We're not going to deviate. 
and we will go from the top. That way everybody sees it verbatim. So what is the thing that has upset you, frustrate, you frustrated you, or made you angry that you want to focus on for this conversation? Uh, so I have two to pick from. I think I'm going to go with my example from work because it really bothers me that this bothers me. So uh, there is someone at work, a couple someone's at work, who um, I work, I'm a therapist for kids with autism, and there is a very right and wrong way to do things sometimes. <laughs> and I am really judgmental of some of my coworkers, which has sort of taken me by surprise. Um, there are some people who just don't do the job consistently, and consistency is one of my values, but it doesn't feel like it fits here. There's something more. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, but I get really angry with this one person in particular because she will blatantly ignore when the rest of us say, hey, so this is not quite how we do things. Mm -hmm. And then sure. she walks and does it exactly the opposite way, and we're like, oh. yeah. <laughs> There's my example for now. <laughs> okay, so what I'm hearing is, just to make sure I'm clear, is some there are right ways and wrong ways because of the fact that you're working with a population that, you know, requires structure and all of that. I can appreciate that for sure. There are right ways and wrong ways. This person hears what she should do and then basically turns around and does the opposite. Does what she wants. Okay. Okay. That's, that's enough. That's all we need to know about the situation in order to go on to the next question then, which is total control, right? You get to control yourself in that situation. You get to control her and her behaviors and her thoughts and everything. You get to control the setting, the circumstances. You get all of it. And so if in this situation you had total control, what would be the thing that you would want to change most of all? What was the main thing that you would change? So I think it would just be when a team lead or a senior staff says to her, hey, this is actually what we do with this child, she would walk away and do it. Mm -hmm. like, yep. Follow the direction that you're given instead of doing whatever you want. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, good. And so that would seem to be like, I think the most obvious change that people would see like, oh, well, she, what frustrates you is that she doesn't do what she's told. So the change you would make is that she does what she's told. I think it's really important really quick, just as like a, an aside here, we're not talking about you. Yeah. Anyone who did this could come up with other changes they might want to make, right? They could change the way that they were. They would be like, well, I wish I were more relaxed about it or laid back about it. Like, I'm not saying that's an answer that you would should give, but that well, is I'm one possibility, but that does not necessarily mean that they're like, that's just one, that that is a possibility. However, yes, go ahead. So I've had that thought because yeah. I've, I've had days where I've sat there and I'm like trying to dig into why this bothers me so much. Like, and the only thing I can come up with is that her inconsistency with these children makes our jobs harder. Like the therapists who actually follow protocol and follow the way things are done, mm -hmm. when other people don't follow those, it, we're the one that gets the behaviors. We're the one that gets the aggression. Um, the therapists who are doing their jobs correctly mm -hmm. are punish isn't the right word, but we see, we have the downfall of her not doing her job correctly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, like another possible answer somebody could give would be like, um, I wish I didn't have to have this job. Like, I wish I could just, you know, quit and walk away. Yeah. That is not to say that that is your answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like important to know that just because it's the most obvious answer doesn't like I've had people who tell me about these horrible circumstances that they're in. And I say, if you could change anything, what would you change? And you might assume they would say, well, I would make this entire situation go away. But they don't. They recognize, oh, there's something here 
that is maybe important or necessary or what I may not like it, but okay, so now what else would I change? So it's just very important for you as the individual when you're getting asked this question, like what you did, you sat with it and you thought about it and you answer honestly and you really consider it. If you want to go to an immediate obvious answer, but it doesn't feel right, don't give that answer. Go with what you know feels right. And honestly, I find myself sliding into these moments where I am not in my integrity because there's a lot of like back chatter and things happening behind her back. And I don't like the person that I am at work sometimes now because of my reaction to the situation. And I haven't been able to pinpoint exactly why I can't pull out of that, which is unusual for me so it's driving me crazy so now we're going to get to that thing in question three now so you've identified the thing you would change is that she would do what she was asked to do (laughs) there it is now the question number three is what is it about that change that you value most of all that she does what she is asked what is it about that change that you value most of all that the child is getting appropriate therapy and the appropriate um, gosh, that's a hard one. Um, okay, I think that's it. I think that's mostly it. Is just that I want to say consistency, but it doesn't. That doesn't feel right to me. Like it doesn't appropriate feel appropriate for the child. That was the phrase. What is yeah. it about that appropriate for the child that you value most of all? there's something in there and I can tell. So don't feel like you got to rush it. I don't know. It just, it feels like we're really important people for these kids. Like they depend on us to learn important skills. And if some of us have our hearts in it and some of us don't, they aren't benefiting from being there. Like they should be benefiting from being there. Mm -hmm. Um, and what is it you value most of all about them benefiting we're just going to keep coming back to that question um just being able to live life to be able to be successful and to be able to have relationship with people and to be able to connect with people. I mean, these are kids who struggle with basic, you know, social skills and connection. And so, I don't know, like, it feels really important and really significant that that these parents trust us to give their children, you know, especially the couple of children that I am thinking of, they're little. And so it's such formative years with them. Um, and we have them for a good chunk of the day. And they, tr- you know, they go through um, quite a few therapists while they're there. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So I don't know. There's just, it doesn't feel oh, like the word is like, right. Yeah. It doesn't feel fair to them to have to almost like it's a waste of time. Like, it feels like it's a waste of time. Like, this whole hour that this person has this child feels like a waste of time. Mm -hmm. They're not doing their job correctly. So there are two words I'm going to throw out there. I don't know if they're going to be the ones, because I think that, like, that idea of it's not fair, but there's something about that even that ties back to something more. What is it about that? It's not fair. I hear, um, I hear you said formation, um, so, like, you're form, you're helping this person to form their, understanding of the world you're helping that with that formation and then then this one other word came up you didn't say it but it came into my head I'm just going to throw it out there but like not thriving exactly but you said living right living formation like thriving like being able to function but not even just function it's like live yeah Yeah. is there a phrase live your best life would you say is there something a word that you would have I think thriving is a really good word yeah formation, th- that thriving, living your best life, like that phrase may be all, and, and thriving, those two, but if there's other words that come into your mind around that. I, really, I mean, I really value um, 
one of my top core values is being challenged is challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we are helping these kids through the most challenging thing they're probably ever going to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think there's, when we first did my values assessment, you were like, there's more words tied to challenge, but we don't know what they are yet. And it feels like there's definitely, I think thriving might be, that's a good one. And that, or formation, both of those I think are good springboards there. They're getting to something. They're getting to something more mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's why I love my job is because it is such a challenge. Mm -hmm. because I'm also helping these kids through something like it's not only is, is it challenging for me, but it is extremely challenging for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like therapy is not easy for these kids, even when it's the most basic stuff sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, Ugh, I'm just like staring at my list of values to see if there's anything that it's tied to, but but living your best life, I think the way that you said that, there's something around that because when I think, when I, just knowing what I know about you, like I see that value showing up in a bazillion other ways in your life. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Remember that at, at formation, you've been raising these kids in your, you know, you've got your kids and it's been so important for you throughout your life, the form, their formation as individuals mm -hmm. and there, there's I mean, something was, in there. Yeah. Holy hell, Becky. So that is essentially, I gave up 20 years of my life yeah. to help form these children into good humans. Yeah. Like, I completely gave up my entire, like, at the beginning of my adulthood just to help these children mm -hmm. become good humans, you yeah. know? Um, and it's still really hard for me that I had to make the choice to sort of move them into school, but it was, a, it was the right choice for them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I feel like all of the choices that I'm making. Whew, and now yeah. you found a new way to express whatever that value is through the job that you do, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Holy cow. Okay.